Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Debbie Miller, and I produce the Ranch Mirage Writers Festival. Welcome to this week's Coachella for the Brain. We've, we've got great programming for you and hope you take advantage of all these events. Um, first, please check your cell phone. No one wants to be the one person that it goes off during the talk, right? We don't want it to be any of you. So we're really honored again today to have the founders of the Rancho Mirage Riders Festival, the wonderful Jamie Kabler and his fabulous partner, Helene Galen. None of this would be possible without the two of them, so we all owe them a debt of gratitude. Um, we want to thank Ted Weil, who represents our City Council of Rancho Mirage. The City Council and the, the entire City of Rancho Mirage has been instrumental in making these events, as well as the Writers' Festival, happen. We couldn't do it without them as well, so thank you, Ted, and thanks to the City of Rancho Mirage. Um, if you enjoyed today, come back tomorrow. Jeffrey Frank's going to be here tomorrow as well. You get another book, only tomorrow it's on Ike and Dick. It'll be a little different format, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So join us again. November 10th, we ha that's this Thursday. We have three this week. Thursday, we have James Burroughs in conversation with David Lee. James Burroughs directed Friends, Cheers, Taxi, Will and Grace, and David created Cheers and Frasier, so it'll be a great conversation. Please go to our website for some more information. Jeffrey Frank was a senior editor at The New Yorker and the deputy editor of the Washington Post's Outlook section. He's the author of the best-selling Ike and Dick, which you can get tomorrow. He's published four novels, among them the Washington Trilogy, The Columnist, Bad Publicity, and Trudy Hopedale. He's a contributor to The New Yorker and has written for The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. He's joined today by Douglas Miller, who's an avid reader, an accomplished member of the judiciary, and an all-around great guy. I could be a little prejudiced. He's also my husband. <laughs> Please welcome Jeffrey Frank and Douglas Miller. It's not very often I get to introduce, or I get to kiss the person who introduces me, because it's usually a bailiff. <laughs> so welcome, and uh, welcome here to the Rancho Mirage Rider Series and to the desert. Usually I make some kind of a joke about, you know, the sun and how hot it is, but you actually got to come in what I think is the most beautiful time. You get to see clouds and blue skies. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. And it's, thank you all of you for, for showing up on this beautiful day and sitting in, sitting in the dark here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a wonderful book. I think, as you know, I've already told you that I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's an interesting time in our history. It's well-researched, and it reads really, really well. It's almost like a diary. But for me, it had a very personal and emotional aspect. It answered questions that I asked my dad that he wouldn't answer about World War II, about the atomic bomb, and about Korea, which he was involved in you know, directly and indirectly. So I, I really enjoyed this book. And, and I want to start right with the cover. Um, and I, oh, thank you for putting it up here. Um, and the first is, I think I told you that, you know, Debbie's in Broadway, I'm rock and roll. Did, did the cover have something to do with Abbey Road and the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> the, cover, the cover, I love the cover. It's, a, it's something of a cheat in the sense that he wasn't president then. This was a, a year or two after he left the White House, and he, he, he moved back to Independence, Missouri, his hometown, where he lived the rest of his life. And that's him walking walking through the town square in Independence. And, uh, and it's, it's a wonderful picture. 
And, uh, and, and you can tell from the title that this was an extraordinary time in our history. But what did you mean by an ordinary man? Because he was someone who really, really wasn't ready for it. He was, he was, a, he was a guy who had someone, the editor of the Kansas City Star, when after Roosevelt died and, Ro and Truman was suddenly became president, he said, here was a man who for 10 years did nothing but look at the rear end of a horse. And that, was, and that was Truman. He had worked on a farm, his family farm, for 10 years. And then and he actually didn't become a national politician. He ran for the Senate when he was 50 years old. And that was, that was the beginning of his national career. And, uh, and he was indebted to, to, a, to the bosses of, of, of Missouri, of, the, of, of Boss Pent Pentecost. So he really wasn't, no one could have been less ready for the job of president than Harry Truman. He became more ready as time went on. And as, he, he, as a senator, he became more serious about being a senator after his first term. But yeah, he was a very ordinary guy, family guy. He, was a, he, he never, never would have, not only would not have never cheated on his wife, he never would have, I can't imagine, even thought of cheating on Bess. And he was devoted to his wife, to his daughter, and to his family. And he wrote to his mother, and he wrote to his mother almost every day while he was in office. The letters, the letters, by the way, are, are, are really wonderful. And, they're, and they weren't just sort of, hi, mom, I'm fine, how are you? Um, there were, today I did this. Um, and he called, the day that, that Germany surrendered, he called her. <laughs> oh, where, where's the, is it, I don't know if I can, okay, okay. Wait, Debbie, can you come fix it? I didn't get it quite. So, so while she's doing that, I'm going to set up my next <laughs> question. Um, so maybe you can tell us how long he had been vice president before Franklin Delano Roosevelt passed away. He'd been vice president for three months. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, he, and he, he only became vice president because Franklin Roosevelt was trying to find someone who wasn't going to offend Somebody. He had two. He, it was down to two choices. His his previous vice president was Henry Wallace, who was considered something. Not, he, he wasn't. He was, certainly wasn't a, a communist, but he was considered flirting with sort of fe fellow traveling at one point. He was kind of a, a strange guy in some ways. Um, he was his his sort of personal beliefs were a mixture of someone said Judaism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, and a number of number of other things. And he was he was kind of a, a strange guy. He was and, and he was uh, but he was a he was a well-to-do man. He had done well. He had, he, had, he, had, he, had, he had done well uh, in, in business, and, uh, and he was very popular with labor. But people were worried that, that Roosevelt's health was, was, it, it, was, wasn't, it was something of a secret how, how ill he was, and it was a real concern that he, might, that, he, that he might die. No one thought he would die as soon as he did die, but, Henry, but then Henry, no one really wanted Henry Wallace to be president. The other candidate for the job was a man named, Fra was, was a man named Jimmy Burton, James Francis Burns, and Roosevelt had actually promised him the job. But Roosevelt could be a little bit duplicitous, and he did not want Jimmy, Jimmy Burns to be to be president uh, or vice president. And he had, uh, and he and he basically had had one of his aides tell tell Burns, "Sorry, it's, we, we can't we can't do this." And so Truman was considered a, a compromise. Burns was a problematic because because African Americans didn't like him, didn't trust him with good reason. Labor didn't like him or trust him with good reason. And Truman basically offended no one. He was a Middle Westerner. He was a moderate, and so he he fit the bill. And that was, and so it became Harry Truman. So during that three-month period, what kind of a relationship did he have with Roosevelt? They met once for lunch, <laughs> <laughs> and that was in August after the convention. Um, they knew each other, but I'm, I'm not sure. But I'm not sure actually ever had a real conversation bef before that. They, and and he, um, uh, I mean, uh, and Truman went off campaigning. Uh, Roosevelt basically didn't do it. Roosevelt was not a well man. Truman did most of the campaign. He was not a great campaigner. Somebody said listening to his speeches were like someone listening to someone translated from the Hindustani. He was uh, he would sort of read. It was he, he uh, but he would so he would show up and and speak, but uh, but he he left no really no 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 imprint. And so, but they were elected. Roosevelt was Roosevelt, and uh, so that was uh, so that's why uh, that, that's how he became the, the, the vice president. So Roosevelt could be, absolutely Roosevelt could barely stand up at his inauguration. His, his son helped him stand up and so on. It was, it was so, so he didn't go to college, right, Truman? No, no. And he had been in World War I. Yeah, that was the, maybe the formative experience of his life. And so what prepared him all of a sudden to be thrust into the presidency? Well, I think, I mean, he did, as I say, he became a senator, and he was, a number of things, he was a, he was a very hardworking man. He, was, he did his homework. He was a good, really good student, and he... And he he learned his lesson, and he, and he was so. In that sense, he 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 
he was he, he made himself prepared. He had also, as a senator, he also actually had begun had done some substantive things. He had he had chaired something called the Truman Committee, which was looking at, looking at at sort of waste and fraud in in the defense industry. And and he did it. He did this before the war, and he was he, and he was serious about this. He had done when he was in Missouri politics as a sort of a local sort of a local administrator, he was very good uh, overseeing the expenses of the highway program. He was, he would get involved in how much concrete was used and so on. And he was, so he was a very, he was a detailed guy. And so following and, and you know, looking at the expenses of the, of the defense industry during the war and before the war was what really paid dividends. He was on the, he made the cover of Time magazine as, 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 the, as someone who saved the country millions of dollars. And in fact, while he was doing this, at one point he, um, he, he, he never, there was this very strange amount of money being split, spent in a place called Pasco, Washington. He didn't know what it was for. He called the, the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, and Stimson said, I can't tell you, I can't talk about this. It turns out, of course, this was some of the research being done for the atomic bomb. And, uh, and, uh, and Truman pressed him. Truman said, went back. He wouldn't settle for what I can't tell you. And Stimson finally said, listen, this is what the president wants, and that's it. And Truman, and Truman shut up. Like you say, the, the trials of Harry S. Truman, I mean, he had a lot that he was confronted with. But again, back to this ordinary man, was there something about his personality? I mean, I, I don't think you'd describe him as inspirational or charismatic, no, but was no. there something about he, his personality? I think he clearly, well, one, he clearly he had, he had the ability to lead, and he found that out during World War I. He, was, um, he had never done that before. He is a man whose his eyesight was bad, but he, he enlisted. And he was uh, here was a Missouri Baptist, and suddenly he was he was he was uh, leading a, a bunch of Irish Catholics from Kansas City, and he found and they liked him, they admired him. I think finding this gave him a lot of a lot of sort of self confidence. So that was that was one thing that established him as I think established for him so for himself that he could do this sort of thing. And I say and he and he was clearly a man of of, of integrity, like everyone, like all of us. He would he would exaggerate. He would actually make up things about himself. He would remember things that never happened. But deep down. <laughs> I, I can tell you some of those, but deep down, he was he was an honest, he was an honorable man. Now, I I think all of us may have done that too. Not I have never done it, but I think all, others <laughs> others other other of you may have done it. So, so he he becomes president in April. In yeah. May, Germany surrenders. Yes, and he's traveling to Europe to meet Stalin and Churchill. Had he ever met them before? Did he know anything you know, <laughs> personally about them? And how did how did they react? Yeah. Churchill him? had come through town, but but barely because I mean the war was on. I mean he met Roosevelt. He necessarily never met Stalin, and he were, and no, he was very much aware that that it was, there was a, a stature gap. I mean, in some sense, here was here was the here were these two. Churchill had led had led Britain through the, through the war and had given Britain its, you could almost say given Britain its its backbone. Stalin had seen that Russia had suffered more than any other. Country probably during the war they lost 20 million people, and he was and Truman was but what Truman Truman was president of the United States. This was the richest, most most powerful nation in the world. Suddenly, much more so than we can imagine today, and uh, so he was so he sort of he sort of he held his own, and uh, and uh, and so that it was it was a it was a big deal for him. But he he studied up, and people warned him that that Stalin was a man who may not could not always be trusted. And and was and Churchill he was aware that that he was a charmer and he wasn't he was, he was determined not to be he said I'm not going to fall for fall for his soft soap, and uh, and and he sort of did fall for it. But they were but he was he was he wanted to be ready. And I say he studied and then he was also briefed by people. Avril Harriman, who was the um, U.S. ambassador to 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 Russia, the Soviet Union, during the war, he had he had seen Stalin right after right after Roosevelt died, and he had hurried home and he was worried that Truman was not was not going to be ready for Stalin. And he, and he warned Truman that Stalin was probably not going to keep his word in terms of, in terms of, of making the Polish government sort of a, a, co sort of a coalition government between, but, but between the so-called so um, ex exile government in, in Great Britain and the, and, the, and, the, and the Soviet faction. And, and of course, Stalin did not keep his word. But Truman was ready for this. And he, um, so that was, uh, so he was, in that sense, he was ready. But mainly he was ready because he was, he knew, he, he was the leader of, of the United States. The only country that had this, by the way, this, the ultimate weapon, no other country had the bomb, and, and no other country knew about the bomb uh, and, and, uh, it, before he went to Potsdam. So he was, and he made himself ready. That, I think that was the secret. He made himself ready. He studied, he worked, and he was determined to, he was determined to, to live up to this, to this job. And he, was, he wrote home to his wife, he wrote home to Bess, I'm scared, but he didn't show it. So I, I love when a book 
has an interesting fact that surprises me that I didn't know. And at this time when he met Stalin, Stalin was concerned that Hitler had survived. Well, was, and he even makes that comment. So did he mean that, or was that a concern? I or? don't know. Um, I mean, Harry, Harry Hopkins went over to see, before, the, before, before Potsdam, there was one of these, pre, these meetings ahead of time. Uh, Joseph Scavies, who had been the ambassador to Russia, who was you know, met Churchill, Churchill, uh, which, which was not a success. And then Harry Hopkins, who Stalin sort of know, knew, uh, met, uh, met with Stalin to talk about, they would talk about a number of things, the, the Polish question, which was never settled, and where the third meeting, there, there had already been two sort of big three meetings, and uh, there had been one in, and, and, in Cairo, and, and, and one in, um, in, in, in Georgia, in, in the Crimea, and the, uh, and the third one, I guess, that they basically settled was going to be, be in Berlin. And, uh, and Stalin sort of let drop that, that, that yeah, he'd heard that Hitler was still alive, and he didn't drop the subject. There were questions whether, I mean, there were all these rumors, there were stories that Hitler had been seen in Argentina, a submarine had landed in Argentina, who knows? I mean, there, I mean how many of these stories went, went on for a while? There was even a sort of manhunt for Hitler at one point, at one point right after the war, but no one found him. <laughs> <laughs> so we could spend an hour just on what happened in the first three months, yeah. because I believe the order to drop the atomic bomb was in July, July 25th of right. 1945. But before we get to that, when he became president, did he know there was an atomic bomb being developed? Not, not right away. It took a few, a few days. And then uh, I mentioned Henry Stimson had, had, had basically turned, t t ignored these phone calls or told him, stop, stop pushing me. But then he went, after Truman became president, he said, I have something of some urgency to talk to you about. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then, and then he, they came to the White House and, and, and told him about this, this, this weapon that, no, had, that had not yet been tested, by the way. They, but it was being developed, and, uh, and yeah, and it said it had the, the capacity to an enormous amount of damage. No one really knew. Um, Jimmy Burns, actually, the, I mentioned him, the, who, who, was, who actually Truman made his secretary of state, he, he had heard that it could destroy the entire world. There were, these, there were these stories, and no one really knew how much power it had. But, he, but no, then Truman was told about it, and he, when he went to Potsdam, he still, he didn't know whether this thing existed or not. It was actually the, the day after he got there on July 16th, he had, they, they had a tour of Berlin. He visited the Griffith Pass, the Hitler bunker, and when he got back, he was told he was briefed that they, this thing was tested in in in, uh, in 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 New Mexico, and it went off, and it was a huge success. It was a story that a, a blind woman saw the light. It was that was it was that bright. <laughs> so so this is another area where my family was personally affected, yeah. and, and that answered some questions because my grandfather worked in St. George, Utah, mm -hmm. where some of the testing was just miles away, yeah. and he eventually developed cancer and then passed away. So it's, yeah. this time period was so interesting to me and, and so personal to me. But the, the question I want to ask is, did he give the order to drop the first atomic bomb? Yes, yes, but, 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 I, but I would never say it was his decision. This decision, this decision had been made. The, I mean, the, the idea that this was this momentous decision that Truman made, this doesn't, this doesn't, it doesn't work because here is, we were at war with a hated enemy. It was a way to end the war. The, the Battle of Okinawa had, had caused an enormous amount of casualties and the idea that the alternative to ending the war with an atomic bomb would be a land, a land invasion of Japan with new, who knows how many deaths and casualties there would be. There were some estimates would be as many as half a million. That wasn't, that was not going to happen. But anyway, there was not even a question that, a, that an American president in wartime with the op with the, with the opportunity to save American soldiers' lives could not, would not do what needed to be done. And that was, there was no decision at all. And, that, and that's why, that was the first bomb. The second bomb, not even clear who gave the order. It was sort of in motion, the bomb in Nagasaki. And it's not clear when that even needed to be used. But the, but the first bomb, it, it, was, it was a fait accompli before, before, before Truman. But Truman did give the order. And, and I'm going to switch from chronological order to ask you something out of uh, that sure. order. Did he have regrets about the atomic bomb? Did he feel guilty about it? He never said he did, and I don't think he did. He had, he had moments. I want to call it conscience, but he would, he he would he would he he, he would talk about it, and he would he would. But he was aware of of, of what it cost, and he would say he, when he said he did not want another bomb drop. I don't want to be responsible for all those kids dying. But in fact, there was a third bomb ready to go, and he probably if Japan hadn't surrendered, it probably would have been dropped. But yeah, I think it, bo it bothered him. And we, um, Truman's, one of Truman's sons, Clifton Daniel, the, the son, um, became very much involved with this. And very, he, very he, he, he was never 
a poster, but he became almost obsessed with this. And I've, I've talked to him, and I was at the, Cl the Truman Library when Clif Clifton Daniels showed up, and, 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 and one, of the, one of the descendants of, of someone who had done those, the sort of, the, the, the cranes that had been, that had been, these paper cranes had been made um, um, at the end, of, and this woman who died, she died of le leukemia, of the after effects of the bomb in Hiroshima. And this was presented to the Truman Library by, by, by Clifton and by one of the, by one of the survivors. And he, his, he made several trips to Japan, and that was, that it was on, I'm not sure it was on Clifton's conscience, but it was on his mind a lot. Truman, no, I mean, he was, he just said, he thought he had no choice. He would say, I, I did it, I would do it again. And, and I think he meant that. And did I read correct that the Truman Library was the first presidential library? No, no, no? I, mean, I think the Roosevelt one was, and the, but, and, but the Truman was the first really great library, I think, the, and, and followed by the Eisenhower, which was a wonderful library too. And, but, and, uh, and then there's the sort of mixed bag after that. Some of the newer ones are people, people, the Clinton Library, people can't find things suddenly. And the, the Nixon, and, and the Nixon Library, when I went there, was a sort of bifurcated place. I think it's pretty good now. It was pretty good when I was there, but there were sort of, there were two sides. There was the foundation on one side and the archives on the other side, and they never really trusted each other. <laughs> So, so that brings up for me an interesting question. H how do you research a book like this? It's not like you can go talk to someone who can give you a first-hand personal account. How, no, how even though in this case there were a few people. I, one of the people I met, by the way, I should, I'll, I'll talk about the research, but I, I, I got to know David Acheson, who was Dean Acheson. You know, Dean Acheson was one of the most pivotal figures for Truman. He was the Secretary of State for, for the last four years of the administration. And David, David Atchison, when I met him, he was 93 years old. He was in great shape. He, 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 he regretfully died a couple of years ago. And he was wonderful. A wonder, he was a wonderful resource. And there were some people, and, and, there, were, and there were second generation people who were very helpful to me. But no, mostly the research was done, done at libraries. I went to the, if you want to hear, I went to the Truman Library several times. The, the, James, Burns, the James Burns papers were you know, Clemson, South Carolina. The Roosevelt Library, the Library of Congress was a wonderful, the, the, the New York Public Library, the New York Historical Society, which had the diary, the, 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 the diary of, one of, of one of Truman's secretaries of, of, of defense. And then I realized, I was, you mentioned Korea, I wrote a lot about Korea, and I, I can't keep doing this without going to Korea. So I, 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 went, I, went to, I was lucky enough that I could be able to make all these trips before COVID came. I think I just beat, beat the outbreak of COVID, and I, was, I feel so, so lucky to have done that. So a lot of it, so then, then, I, then a lot of the writing was done in upstate New York, but the but I but I but I've had the chance to do a lot of this research, and then the and then on and the internet is pretty good too for a lot for a lot of things. That, uh, so you hinted a little bit about his his racial views. He, I believe, started or or at least began the integration of the military. Can yeah. you, can you tell us a little bit about that and his views on race? His views on race were very conflicted. I mean, he grew up in. In Missouri, and he was the he was the, the, the descendant of, of, of Confederates. I mean, he was, and his sympathies were probably probably deep down with the South as he was growing up. But he understood somehow, or he did understand, that a president has a larger duty, a larger duty to, to everyone. And he, so he was torn. To, he was torn in two ways. He was torn by his feelings about African Americans, which were not which were not positive in general. But he also, but but when that was over, that was trumped by his. Sorry to use that word, but that was that was, uh, <laughs> that was but his his what he felt was his larger duty to all the people, and he was and that was really sincere, and he overcame it, and there was a uh, and then he was really and then he became genuinely shocked by some of the by some of the some of the attacks on on African Americans. There was there was a particularly horrendous attack against against a man, a, 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 a Sergeant Isaac Woodard, on his way home from the war, and he was intentionally blinded by a by a policeman in South Carolina. I think it was and he was even in his uniform in his at the uniform. time. But I think he had asked to use the men's room, and they had been back and forth, and that was enough for someone to call, call the cops, and the cop took his nightstick and intentionally poked, yeah, exactly. And, there was, and, and that was a horrendous case, and, and, that, and that got some publicity, but then Orson Welles had a radio broadcast in those days, and he talked about it. He read the entire, affid Isaac, Sergeant Or Woodward's affid affidavit was written, read aloud, and Truman heard about this, there were lynchings, and this really got to him, and then Truman said, enough is enough, Truman made a speech in, in, in the summer of, of, of 47 in front of the Lincoln Memorial, and he had all of the enemies of the Confederacy there, Justice Black, Eleanor Roosevelt, and it was a really good speech, and Walter White, the, who, was the, who was the executive director of the NAACP, 
And he made, he said, we're going to, you know, enough is enough. Um, African Americans should have every opportunity that everyone else has. This, we should have equal justice, equal opportunity for jobs, education. And he meant it. And after the speech was over, Walter White said, I, thank you for saying these things. And Truman said to Walter White, I wouldn't have said it if I didn't mean it. He sort of meant it. And, and he, sent, he, he did send a message to Congress asking for legislation which would, which would sort of end, end Jim Crow on interstate travel and, and, and some other things. And it was a real, it was, a, it was maybe the first positive step towards civil rights um, for, uh, for, since, uh, for, for, for decades. And, uh, and, that's, and that was so, so, it was such a strong message that it, bas it alienated the, the South, the Southern Democrats. And that, that actually, you could actually almost say, you could almost see the development of American politics after that. Um, the, the South basically boycotted Truman, and, and, and they, some of them walked out of the 1948 convention, and, and then in, in 19, and then in that election, there was a, there, you, you, you all know about the Dixiecrat, General uh, Strom Thurmond, who was the governor of South Carolina, became a ticket of this sort of independent of the so-called Dixiecrat party, and ran against Truman and, and took quite a number of electoral votes, so many that there was actually a, a fear that he might have the election might have been thrown into the House. And, and you can almost date through Truman's courage on this issue, and it, was, it did show courage. They're changing everything. And then suddenly, the Democrats of the South became Republicans as the next 20, 20 years evolved, and so on. And that was so. That was a that was a huge cha change in our electoral politics, and it was a huge change for Truman. And uh, as he became older and became crankier, he began to sort of say other things. And he would say, "Well, I would, I would never, you know, he, he, the, the lunch counter sit in say, well, it, was, it was my place. I wouldn't let people in either.' But he, but genuinely, he meant it, and he and he was a and he was, he was a very positive force for civil rights. So, again, there was something in your book that was something I didn't know I found interesting. It's a speech that Churchill did in Missouri. Yeah. I think at uh, Westminster uh, College in yeah. Fulton, Missouri. Right. And a term came out of that that we're all familiar with, the Iron Curtain. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that speech and the reaction to it in the Soviet Union and in America and around the world. Yeah, that was a, that was a really, that was a, a surprising occasion. That's, I, I just say I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> Truman, um, no, tr I'm sorry, uh, Truman had invited Churchill to, the, 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 the Westminster College was the alma mater of one of Truman's cronies, and, and, uh, and, and so they had a great old time. They went out there by train, they played poker, uh, drank whiskey, right? Drank whiskey. Truman told, I mean, Churchill told sort of tired stories about about the about the, the Crimean War or something, or the, and and, other, and 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 the and 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 they went and then and Truman said that he had no idea what Churchill was going to say. He didn't know what Churchill was going to say, and uh, and and uh, there was a great, great sort of concern that about what he was going to say. Churchill, yeah, Churchill gave the so-called Iron Curtain speech, in which he in which he simply. He talked about this, this this great break in the world and and uh, between east and west and 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 uh, and we've uh, and this this the, this this sinister ideology has 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 taken over country after country and we're all at, all at risk. I mean, that's, I'm I'm not, I'm I'm giving a very simple version of this. And it was um and but what and, and it's why it was widely applauded by some, but not over here. In, over here, there was a lot of people appalled by this. It was this this was this was not. This, this was this was just after the war. This shouldn't this shouldn't be said. Stalin said this was this reminded him of the sort of thing that Hitler was saying before the war, and there was a lot of editorial reaction, adverse editorial reaction to it, and and also also reaction in, the, in Great Britain. Churchill had not really shown the speech to Clement Attlee, who had succeeded him as prime minister, and uh, so so there was a lot of so, so it was it was a diplomatic. It was a diplomatic faux pas. And on the other hand, it was a, it became an historic speech. And uh, but Churchill was based. I mean, Truman was. They said you, we have to we have to make make some amends. And Churchill actually sent a message to Stalin: If you'll come over, I'll, I'll, you can come to you can come over here. I'll, I'll introduce you the same way, and 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 and, uh, and and you're more than welcome. But Truman had actually made a mistake. Truman had sat next to Churchill while he gave the speech, and he was visibly applauding. <laughs> and so so he had definitely taken sides. And it was and it was sort of a, it wasn't a great moment for. For diplomacy, but it was a great moment for history. And, yeah. and at that time, were things changing with how the Soviet Union sure, was perceived? Sure, the Cold Tell War us about was that. There was a certain, there was a certain chill in the air already, and the Cold War, the Cold War is definitely was definitely happening, uh, definitely on its on its way. Um, the the uh, there was a lot of suspicion on on both sides, and uh, you know what what was Stalin up to, and and then and there was particularly particularly with the atomic bomb. I mean, there was a fear. I mean, there were, we were by you know there were already there was already stories worries about espionage and, and in fact the, 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 the Soviets did get the bomb they, they they had their first we had we had the monopoly up until the 
fall of 1949, but not really, that also affected our policy. It was sort of, I said it's almost like, it's almost like we were like the sort of sun altering the, uh, the orbits of every revolving planet because we had this thing that we didn't have, that we, we, that we weren't the only one to have this thing. Yeah, it did alter, alter things. And the Cold, War, the Cold War developed, and a lot of it had to do with weapons and so on, and a lot of it had to do with, with simple mistrust. And, uh, and, and it was before the war, and, it, and, it came, and it's happened, it, 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 it grew after that. And there were, there were a lot of, the, 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 most, the, most, the most notorious case or famous case was in 1948 when, Truman, when Churchill blockaded the access to Berlin. Berlin was, Berlin was in Soviet territory, but it was this island of Western democracy in the middle of, middle of, of Soviet territory of, 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 Eastern, East, of East Germany. And, uh, and that, was a, that, was a, that was a moment when, when people actually feared a, a war might break out. And, uh, and that's when Truman did something very, very, uh, when, when the Biden did something very smart. And he st the Berlin airlift, which, uh, and they started a, a sort of counter blockade in, in Eastern Europe. And the Berlin airlift was a huge success. It brought, it brought good w w w heating oil and food and so on to, to, all, to, to, to Berlin and, until, until finally Stalin backed down. There was no, there was no war and there was no, uh, but that was in a way, but that was a very, that was a test, a test of, uh, of sort of east, east west strength. And uh, that was, a, and, and it didn't, and it, it stayed. Uh, there, but there were, there were also, but there, were, there was also a kind of informal detente, you, you can almost say. There was no war. And there was a, and that was, a, that was a, uh, but there were some terrible, some real mo moments of, uh, of, of, of tension. And you, you talked about the Soviet Union developing the atomic bomb. Did, in some sense, Truman and, and the CIA, the intelligence, whoever that might have been at that time, kind of misjudge yes. their development of the bomb? Yeah, they knew that Russia was going to get the bomb, but I mean, some of the, some of the big experts said, well, it might be 20 years, or maybe five. Yeah, no one, no one, no one had any idea. And when, it, and when, the, and when, they, when they announced, when they, they actually didn't, the, the bomb was probably set off in August of 49, but they, the White House didn't tell anyone until September. And even, and even so, they didn't want to, at first they didn't, the Secretary of Defense, um, um, Lewis Johnson didn't want to use the word bomb. He said, a, a device, an explosive. No one wanted to sort of say it. And then Dean Acheson, who was then who, Secretary of State, said, Let's, yeah, they exploded a bomb. It went off, and it, was a, it, it really was a bomb. And they, and they have it. And then, and then they exploded their second bomb not, not much later. So, you know, we kind of all know with the last few presidencies the relationship or the poor relationship between the press and the president. What was it like with Truman? What was his relationship with the press? Truman, Truman liked reporters because they were like him. They were men and, well, I was going to say men and women. There weren't very few women, but, men, but people who didn't, who they mostly a lot of them didn't go to college. They were working people. They didn't make a lot of money. They weren't on talk shows. They were, they were like him. The people he could not stand were the publishers and the, and the columnists. The columnists who were sort of, he, he looked at them as sort of, well, they all looked down their, their nose at him. He thought they, they patronized him. He called you know, he, he said Walter Lippmann, who should not be in an ivory tower, should be in a latrine or something like that. <laughs> he, there were these two very powerful colonists, Joe Alsop and Stuart Alsop, who were very, they were, they were at, with the New York Herald Tribune, but syndicated all over the country. Very had a lot of influence. Truman referred to them as the Sop sisters in, 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 in private, in private. And so, so, so but, he, and, but he got along with the press pretty well, and they, they liked him. They would, they would and, and they, they, they would laugh at his jokes, but they would also give him a hard time. But no, it was a very interesting, and I don't think we've had anything like it. And the other thing about that, he met with him almost every week. Can you imagine that today, a president meeting with the, with his, with the press every week, and as he left the White House, he said, what a great thing that this democracy has, that men and women can stand up and ask the chief executive leader of, 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 of a country questions, just, just like that, and that's what he did. And he had difficult questions at times. Sometimes he got in trouble, but he dealt with them almost every week. It was pretty amazing, actually. And am I correct? They couldn't quote him directly yes. until they got it approved by the press by, by, secretary? By the press, yes, that was, that, that was his one safe, safe thing. A little and, different now, right? Yes, yeah. Truman, Truman would say things, and then and they, they would, it would be dutifully reported the next day, and then if, if it was something really newsworthy, you could just... Then, then they would go to Charlie Ross, who was Truman's press secretary, and say, oh, Charlie, can I use this? And then Truman would come up often. Sometimes Truman would say, sure, let's find some variation of it. That happened particularly during when, when Senator Joe McCarthy was, on the, was, was sort of on the attack, and there was something when Truman wanted to say something about McCarthy, but didn't want to mention it by name, and they were able to sort of do, write something out and so on. But yeah, but that was, that was actually a good sort of safety valve for a president. Maybe they should do that today. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, right. So no TV in those days, and radio. Uh, the first TV rest conference was Eisenhower, and, uh, yeah. and, and he only had one or two. Yeah. 
So, so you talked about McCarthyism, just, you know, you mentioned it, and, and kind of the same time it's the rise of J. Edgar Hoover, and there's this concern that, that you know, the communists are going around the world and they're going to take over, and there's also this concern they're infiltrating in uh, the United States. Again, something I didn't know that I found so interesting, especially from a, a legal perspective, is that Truman signed an executive order establishing a loyalty program and loyalty oaths. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I would say well, that was one of Truman's shameful moments because there was, there was really no reason to it. What he did was it was the Federal Employee Loyalty Program. And what it, it required, there were two million federal employees then, and they were all basically had to be fingerprinted, investigated, looked, looked at, and it basically it turned all of the whole, the whole entire civil service into, they became completely, I won't use the word paranoid, but they became aggravated by it. And there's really no reason for it. There was every good reason to sort of, to sort of have, to sort of, to sort of have this, you know, to have the looking out for the, any kind of leakage of atomic secrets and so on, but there was, but this was something, something different. The most celebrated case at the time became the Alger, you know, the Alger Hiss case. There was, Alger Hiss was a, had, had been in the State Department. He'd actually, he'd actually been at, at, at oh, he was almost like a Zelig-like character. He'd been at Yalta, and he had been in, in San Francisco for the UN conference, but, and he was accused of passing secret documents to the Russians. He probably did, I think he did, but there, 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 were such, there was such unimportance that, that, that it, it, didn't, it didn't quite qualify as espionage. He was, ever, he was prosecuted for lying about passing documents to the, to the, but it was in the air, and it was serious, and, and McCarthy didn't really go on his, McCarthy really, Senator McCarthy didn't really go full bore until, until later on. He made his famous speech, it was actually 19, February of 1950, but the, the loyalty program was from 1947. So this was before McCarthy. It was, it was actually during the sort of red hunt in Hollywood and so on. And Truman, Truman went along with it, and, and he was criticized by, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, you can't, you really shouldn't be doing this. And he, some, some people from the State Department were fired sort of arbitrarily with prejudice, which means they had no ground, not only no ground to appeal, but then they were besmirched. They couldn't find another job, basically. And that sort of thing was, was and I think Truman allowed them finally just to be fired. But that, but that sort of thing was going on, and it was not a good situation. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was, was had been in, uh, had been there for a long time, and he was, uh, and he was, and he was, you know, he was the he was the big G man, and he was uh, he was famous for he was famous for because of radio gangbusters and shows like that, and he was uh, he was a real celebrity. But so uh, I want to talk about the Korean War. Yeah, um, and I have a lot of questions about the the Korean War. I, I think I told you, as I started, you know, my dad was in Okinawa as a Marine, and never talked about it. He talked about being on a troop ship outside Japan. Well, I you know, kind of have learned from your book and from others that he was waiting for the atomic bomb to be dropped. He, did, he didn't know about it. He <laughs> didn't know about it. They had no idea. They, no. He talked about how they were stopped out in the ocean, yeah. just bobbing up and down, waiting yeah. to see what they were going to do. Um, you know, but my dad was a Republican, very conservative. Yeah. And when the Vietnam War started, I would have thought, you know, he would want me to go, and, and yeah. there was some chance that I was going to be drafted. And he tells me, under no circumstances are you going. And I was shocked, mm -hmm. because I thought his answer would be just the opposite. So what was it about Korea that impacted men like my dad? I think he began, began to see something that we all began to see, that it was like, it was like the paradigm of, of American mistakes. The Korean War... People have forgotten this. People call it the Forgotten War, but it wasn't forgotten by the Koreans or by the people who were there. 37,000 Americans died in Korea. Um, and uh, I don't know how many more were, were wounded. Um, probably several hundred thousand Koreans, probably more than two million Chinese. Um, it, it, the, 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 the North Korea itself, was it was, our, it was our first use of napalm in war, and we basically burned or destroyed every single town and village in the North. On, on, on the orders of General MacArthur and, and so on. And there was, they, that's, if, if you want to know why there's such antipathy to the United States from Korea, it's because of that. Um, the, 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 the leader of Korea is the grandson of the, of, of the, of the leader of Korea in, in, during the Korean War in 1950. Um, at the end of it, there was a, there was a sub, there, the war has never ended. There was, there was, a, there was a ceasefire and, the, and nothing had changed. The only thing that had changed is that the, line, the boundary line had shifted slightly in favor of the North. And the North picked up one city, Kaesong, which which had been a, a sort of a sort of a maybe or a sort of an ancient city a city in this uh, sort of real history, and that became a part of North Korea. So that was the that was the one, and that's the only thing that, that changed. Nothing changed at all, and that became 
I think that became maybe the paradigm of bad, bad wars of, of Vietnam, which your father would have, would have thought about, another Asian war, uh, and, uh, and, and, then, and then, of course, we know in, our, in modern times, the, our longest war in Afghanistan, which the, with no result again. And that just, and it's wonder, it, it makes you wonder, and I, the, 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 I see this sort of, in many ways, I, I was going to say the Truman era for me, that's when modern history, our history began in the Truman era. Everything that we know today happened, I mean, the seventh day, NATO, then, the United Nations, stupid wars, good wars, all of it was then. And we've, and we've, and we've, some, we've learned a lot, and, we, and sometimes we've not learned anything from, and that's what, and that's what, and that's, that's So what did they about. contemplate using the atomic bomb in Korea? Sure. I mean, certainly MacArthur talked about it a lot. There was some, there was some, sort, of, some sort of frightening thought. MacArthur, MacArthur had a plan to bomb the bomb in a great many places all, along, in, in China too. He was ready to, ready, ready, ready to go. He also had a list of cities to, he also had given a list of cities to hit in the Soviet Union, by the way, if, 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 if need be. He was, he was, MacArthur was ready. So, um, uh, Congressman Al Gore, who was the father of, of the future vice president, had this plan to sort of had, have a belt, a belt of radioactive waste across the, across the, across Korea, to sort of so people wouldn't couldn't couldn't step over the line. They would basically to contaminate a huge portion of Korea to sort of stop any advances. Um, Lloyd Benson, who became who became the vice presidential candidate, he was senator from Texas, ran with Dukakis. He he said, well, we should give an ultimatum to the North. Well, this was during the war, and, and say that if they don't surrender, we're going to drop atomic bombs on you. So it was in the air. And Truman himself actually had hinted that we'll use any weapon at our disposal, then people said, stop it, and he, he backed off. It, it would have made no sense. It would have made no sense in Korea. I mean, in Vietnam, to use an atomic bomb. But, uh, but there was talk of it, and it was... Um, so it's interesting. You know, General MacArthur in World War II became a national hero. Mm -hmm. And in, in reality, he was larger than life during yeah. World War II. He's yeah. in charge of Korea. He never went to Korea, right? He, he, was, he, he did. He never spent a night in Korea. He would fly over from Japan and go back home again. But it never spent. No, 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 no. He had a, he had a very good life in Japan. He lived in the U.S. Embassy. He was the show there, and and, uh, and he and Truman had a difficult relationship. It became difficult. Truman Truman was Truman basically thought he was a horrible person. He said it privately. He's a bunko man. But but in, but but he but he also he really he was uh, he was intimidated by him. everyone was intimidated by MacArthur. Even but people who knew him knew I mean, General Eisenhower. Uh, once said when he was um, uh, he, he he was once said to Ann Whitman who was his secretary private secretary you can see in her diary he said how does such a damn fool ever become a general but he would never but but in public he wouldn't he wouldn't say this um, <laughs> Matthew Matthew Ridgway was surprised why didn't we fire this guy he was he was being insubordinate MacArthur was a considered a personage he was yes you should say he was larger than life I don't understand it but but then you begin to see. After after he, he was fired, a very famous case when Truman finally fired him for, for gross insubordination, and MacArthur came back and gave a speech, and people were completely some people were weeping with with weeping with, with, with so, so emotionally moved. So and so was they heard him speak, and so it was like the voice of God in the room. He, he, I, he came. You, he spoke at Congress. Congress yeah. You can watch this on YouTube, and you say, "Wow, how did this come? Here's this seventy-year-old guy with a big comb over." Holding forth in dramatically, but my God, he was he was he was something. So, but so was, <laughs> I, I thought you that there were some examples you gave that to me showed how intimidating he was. Truman wanted to talk to him in person. Yeah, and MacArthur wouldn't come to Truman. He made Truman fly all the way to Wake Island on a prop plane. It was yes, even even so, actually, true. There was actually no. They were talking about. Where were we going to meet? And then they said, "Well, we'll we'll meet in either Wake Island or or, or Hawaii, where Roosevelt had gone to meet. Uh, we'd gone uh, after uh, just before the end of the war." And I said, "Okay, we'll meet in Wake Island." <laughs> so for Truman, it was yeah, it was a, an incredibly long trip. But Truman wanted to wanted to. It was important to meet him. Dean Acheson thought it was a terrible idea. It didn't have would have nothing to do with it and wouldn't go along on the trip. And he saw nothing nothing good coming of it. Um, but um, yeah, there was there was a meeting on Wake Island. Uh, Truman flew forever, I mean, for hours and hours and hours. They met, um, the, MacArthur arrived the night, night before. MacArthur didn't like flying at night, by the way, so, so, he, made, so, so he arrived the day before, spent, spent the night there, met Truman who, when Truman arrived in the morning. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they had, a, they, they, had a, they had a meeting in the morning. Uh, Truman, uh, MacArthur told Truman, oh, the Chinese will never come in. Uh, and uh, he wasn't worried about that. I could, earlier, he had said, I can, I can take this, I can handle North Korea with one arm tied behind my back. Uh, Truman said, oh, that was, been a, it was a very good meeting we had. Truman went home, 
and uh, McCartney went home, and then and that was that was the meeting. It was maybe and and, and uh, Truman actually said, "Stay for lunch." And I said, I don't, "I don't have time. Basically, I need to I need to get back." He didn't say it that way. He said, "I have to I have to attend to this war. I'm not running." He didn't say it was war that I'm running, and and uh, and so on. And so he went he went back to Tokyo where he was running the war in Korea, and uh, and and and, uh, and Truman came back and made a speech, and and it didn't really go bad until November when the Chinese made themselves known, and that was. Uh, and that was an incredible, incredible rout, and that was basically the turning, turning point of the war. The war didn't end then, and then, then it became bloodier and bloodier. It became like a, someone said it was like a World War II stalemate, sort of the, the, line, of the, the, the line would go back and forth, and, and that's when all these casualties happened. Uh, so many, so many, you can, I mean, I, in the book, I sort of, I mean, the number of homeless people of Koreans and Chinese, and, and the number of dead and maimed of Americans, it's just, it's incredible, and, and to what end? So one other example, if yeah. I get this correct, yeah. when they met on the tarmac, MacArthur wouldn't salute, That's right? True. He just shook his hand. Yes. He wouldn't salute the commander in chief. No, he, he did say, he did say, pleasure to meet you, sir. And he was wearing this sort of slouchy cap, this sort of, this sort of ham and eggs cap that he wore and so on. And, and he was, no, he didn't show, I mean, he, he, he said the right things, but he didn't, but I know even, even uh, but he never reported properly. Eisenhower and Truman had, had their difficulties and a real falling out, but Eisenhower always, always respected protocol, the protocol between a, between a military man and a, and, and a president. MacArthur obviously didn't, and even, I mean, when he was fired, I have to get into that, Truman had, was trying to reach a, some, that's when the first peace talks began before Truman left office, and MacArthur basically said, told MacArthur, do not advance anymore north of the, 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 the boundary of Truman, or the uh, boundary of Korea, which sort of arbitrary was the 38th parallel, and the order was don't advance beyond that 38th parallel. MacArthur, MacArthur went on, and, and he said, I will not, you know, I'm not going to stop it. That was, and that, that was really, that, that disobedience was which led to MacArthur's dismissal. And when he, and he finally did fire him. He did fire him. And what was the reaction? The first reaction was, 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 was fury at Truman. Um, there were several, several, um, several motions um, for impeachment in Congress, uh, and so on, but that tied up, it was interesting, it tied up, very, Truman's political sense was pretty good. He, had, he kind of knew this wasn't gonna last, and it didn't last. Uh, MacArthur went on a sort of victory tour after he gave his speech, the one, the one, that, the, the one that was televised coast to coast, and everyone was, and, and it became, ended with the famous words, I, or man, but old soldiers never die, they just fade away, which, and, and, but then the, the crowd became thinner and thinner and thinner. And then, and then MacArthur himself kind of, kind of vanished, and he was he he moved into the Waldorf Tower. He became an executive with, with Remington Rand, the office supply company, and uh, and then offered his plan to President Elect Eisenhower, to to bomb to send to bomb atom bomb the North Korea into submission. That that and Eisenhower just, and that was the end of and MacArthur. Sort of vanished. So oh, I'm sorry. That's right. He actually returned. He was he, he he wanted to run for president himself in '52. He became he actually gave the keynote speech keynote speech in 1952, and he's even hoping that he could run with Robert Taft, but that was that didn't Taft didn't get the nomination. Eisenhower did, and of course that never never happened. So another thing that I didn't know that uh, was interesting is there was an assassination attempt on Truman. Yeah. Tell yeah. us just a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean that was that was actually during it was actually during the Korean War. He was. The, the, the White House was being renovated in, in 1950, and Truman moved across Lafayette Square to, to, to the Blair House, which is which is this very nice old house, which is still where we put where, where, where we put guests from abroad. And Truman was was living there, and he suddenly out suddenly there were these gunshots outside. It, it was an assassination attempt. It didn't get any further than 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 outside, but a but a, a, a DC police officer was killed. Two Puerto Ricans had, had, were doing. One of them was wounded. One of them one of them was. Not, and Truman and Truman was upstairs, heard it, was, and, and they were saying, "Get down, get down!" Because he was he stood at the window looking down at this, <laughs> at this sort of thing, and, uh, and and that was it. But no, but it, but that was it. But but that it, but it was it was not a non-event. I mean, it it shook him. It really shook Bess, his wife, who was nervous enough having living with this whole thing. And then Truman used to actually walk across the used to go, there was still an office at the White House. He would walk from Blair House to the White House. And someone was actually offering tours to sort of watch watch the president take his walk, and that was that was that was shut down after that. So why did he not run in 1952? I think he he said that he could have he could have won he could have won, but he basically he told friends earlier as early as January that he wasn't going to do it again. He he knew he knew he was he had no chance. Horseless, he knew he had no chance against Eisenhower, Stevenson. Who, who he wanted to run in his stead and who didn't and was a very reluctant candidate. I, 
Stevenson was a very strange, strange, a very strange guy in many ways. Uh, people don't realize that he was when he was 12 years old. He shot and killed a a, a, a friend, a, a friend of, of 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 his sisters at, at at a birthday party. It was an accident, but this kind of thing sort of shattered his his life. And he, um, but Stevenson. So Stevenson was 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 not going to. And, and Eisenhower just said. Um, uh, I mean, Truman understood that uh, that he that he just couldn't do. Stevenson said, "I can't. Well, I, I'm not going to. I couldn't win against Eisenhower. The, the country is probably ready for a change." So, and then Truman. Furthermore, Truman was primaried. Um, Estes Kofavre, a senator from Arkansas, who Truman called used to call he's called Senator Cow Fever. But uh, Truman, Truman, well, Truman didn't like someone. He 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 was actually he was pretty good at sort of making up nicknames. I mentioned the all the Sop Sisters. They'd be a Senator Cow Fever, and. Uh, and Truman, uh, Truman uh, lost. He lost his primary in, 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 New, in New Hampshire. That was, by the way, the primary where Eisenhower beat Senator Taft. It was basically a write-in candidate. Yeah. Two more questions, and then we'll hopefully have some time for some questions from the audience. But what was this relationship with Eisenhower at that transition of the presidency? Well, say, it, was, it was really, I mean, early, early was really good. He really admired Eisenhower. He thought he was a, he thought he was a great man. And, uh, and Eisenhower thought a lot of Truman. Thought it was, you know, he thought he thought he was, you know, had had courage and stood up for the right things. But then that the 1952 campaign put a, put an end to it. Um, there was one Eisenhower had had maybe his most shameful moment when he was uh, he well, well um, General Marshall, who had been his mentor and his sponsor, had been attacked by Senator McCarthy, who said McCarthy who said that General Marshall General Marshall is guilty of. Of treason, a, a sort of a, a, a record so black, a, a record of such infamy, uh, so black that, uh, that anyway, I forget the exact words, but basically he called him a huge traitor. And Truman and Eisenhower was going to speak in, in, in Marshall's defense. He was going to say, "No, he's a, he's a great man, a great general," and um, and he and then those and those words were t he took he took the words out of his speech, and everyone knows that he was in the speech because the the advanced text had been printed in the New York Times, so everyone knew he was going to say this and then didn't say that. And, when, and Truman knew it, and Truman said, and Truman, that's when Truman began to really be tough. He said, here's a man who has no backbone, no spine. What would you think of a man who would not defend his friend? What kind of, what, what kind of morality is that? And that's something that Eisenhower was pretty thin-skinned to begin with. And this one, this, this he never forgave. And they basically never, I mean, they, I mean, they, 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 they never really, even on the day of inauguration, they barely spoke to each other. They wrote in almost, almost complete silence to the reviewing stand. And uh, so it was, it was not a friendly relationship after that. And so how would you describe Truman's legacy from, from a perspective now, kind of what's his legacy? What were his accomplishments? I think, I think it was, I think his great accomplishment, and I think he, I think, I th was the Marshall Plan, which we haven't talked about. The Marshall Plan, I mean, actually this wasn't even Truman's idea, but it was, but it was, but Truman understood it and he began to realize that it was a great thing. It was something really unique. This is something where, something where a, a country of great power and unlimited wealth did Something unusual. They 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 wanted to help bring back and revive the enemy. I mean, not only not, I mean, I mean, obviously the 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 the, 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 the victorious nations, which were, Europe was a, was a, was a, was wreckage in most of it. But even even Germany, even Japan, and this was an and even this was an extraordinary thing for a victorious power to do. And this was and this was Truman's legacy. I say Truman himself was actually reluctant at first because it was such an expensive thing. And this was, uh, and he was, and, and the, the man who had led the Truman Committee was very conscious of, that, of dollars and cents. But there was a, this was a great uh, uh, lesson in statesmanship. General Marshall himself, uh, Charles Bolin, who helped draft the thing, um, uh, Dean Acheson, who was given some credit for it, and a number of other people. Uh, uh, there's, there are a lot of, I, I quote some of them in, in the book, who were, who were very instrumental. But people basically saw this was something special, a real emergency. And this was a chance to change the world in a good way, and that's, I think that's the most important part of his legacy. And then, and I would say NATO, which has which has lasted and been a very effective um, guarantor of, of peace and stability. Whether whether the expansion of NATO was a good idea is that's something for another for another session, another another. But 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 I think that that's his legacy. And and civil rights. It's it's the idea that a president could do something, even if he personally doesn't approve of it and like it. He 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 knows what trying to do the right thing over and above. Over, over and above his personal feelings, and then and, and then his belief in and he was also he was a man who loved the Constitution. He really did, and he talked about it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for just a couple of questions. Do we have a question, Travis? Um, you haven't talked about Truman and Israel. No, and he, of course, was the 
president who recognized Israel. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yes, he, he was, and there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, pressure against don't do it because you're you're gonna you're gonna set off you're gonna set off Arabs and Israelis for generations to come. Uh, General Marshall was against it. Jim Forrestal, the Secretary of Defense, was against it. Almost everyone was, was against it except, except that was Truman. Actually, Truman would usually listen to his advisors, and he would and he but but sometimes he listened to his to himself and his own emotions. He once said he told I think it was Arthur Crock of the New York Times. He said there are two people sitting in the seat. There's the President of the United States and there's Harry Truman. In the case of civil rights, it was the President who made these decisions. In the case of Israel, it was Harry Truman. Was he influenced by David Niles, his political leader? No, I mean, I think, or, or maybe Eddie Jacobson, who tried to be, who got him to meet, Eddie Jacobson tried to get the, the future President of Israel and Chaim Weizmann. I think Churchill called him Cham, Cham Weizmann and so on. Yeah, all of that. And then, and then the, and then the pictures and the stories of refugees, um, refugees from the, from the, from the death camps, from the Polish death camps, and, and, and so on. So they, that, that was, that was definitely part of it. I think Aaron. This is a chicken and egg question. I was pleasantly surprised to find that you had found new ground, new interpretations, kind of Truman with the uh, bark off the tree. Um, yeah. So my question is, did you go into this? having some expectations of being able to give new interpretations, break some new ground, or did you just find it along the way? And if you went into the book without anticipating new ground, new interpretations, why in the world would you write another Truman book? <laughs> that's, that's, a one, that's, that's the perfect question. And, 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 it's, and the answer is no, I, I, went, into, I went into it without prejudice, and with, but, but knowing that, knowing there's always a lot to be discovered about, about our history, which is endlessly fascinating. I found this when I did Ike and Dick. I wrote about Eisenhower and Nixon. And, and a friend of mine said, don't go into this thinking about Nixon in a certain way. I said, no, I certainly won't. And I began to see both Nixon and Eisenhower in a new way after I, the more you learn, the more you learn about these people, the more, the more interesting they become. And that's true of Truman, too. I was not, no, not going to go in there thinking that he was, this was the, the, the traditional give him hell, give him hell straight from, the sh straight from the hip Truman. No, he was a much more interesting, much more complicated, much more sophisticated man than I expected. And I found that that was really fun. No. So the rest of your questions, Jeffrey, will be glad to answer. Please line up here to have your book signed and ask him some more questions. Join me again in thinking, thanking Jeffrey Frank and Doug Miller. Where, where do I find books? Oh, oh. I'm stiff. Okay. Was it okay?